Shane Bradley is, of course, best known as the founder of Grab One, New Zealand's largest group buying website. And prior to Grab One, Shane founded Find Alerted in the spare room of his home. I wish we could all do that, but I haven't even got one of those. Um, that's back in 2004, before selling 50% of that business to APN in July 2006. Merging with APN Info Media in March 2007, and finally selling to Yellow Pages in 2009. Seller.co.nz was another one of Shane's ventures, founded in 2008 and sold to APN News and Media in 2012. We're very lucky here, and I've asked some of you guys this evening if you do have some extra questions, which I've gotten, but if you find that you've got something else itching, just hold it off until quest uh, Q&A at the end, and we'll fit those in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we've had a, a, the opportunity to have a bit of a chilly chat before yep. um, we got in here. But what I haven't actually asked you is, who is the Shane Bradley before all of this happened? Where are you from, boy? I'm from uh, Rotorua. Um, we got Rotorua, so I um, explains a lot of things. I moved up to Auckland when I was 21, where I had an uh, aluminium window business I was in, um, that I had set up when I was about 19. Um, and moved up here when I was 21 to open up an Auckland branch. And, um, what does a 19-year-old, how, how did you think at 19 years old, I'm going to put windows in? Um, it was one of those things, my uh, dad was a builder, my brother was a builder, yeah. and I thought, hey, let's do something in the, in the sort of family sort of um, spectrum. Um, but it went broke when I was 23, so it didn't work out too well. There's a lot of, stuff, a lot of grind going on. Yeah, no, no, that was, um, that was interesting at that time. I mean, that was, I was 22 with 48 staff, um, and then in 2001 had about 700 grand worth of bad debts come into it, and about probably... I know, six months time, so actually went into liquidation in September the 11th, 2001. September, sorry, the 14th, 2001. How does somebody that young cope with, it's a massive responsibility. I don't know, there's some deep dark days, you know, when you go to liquidation, you get for six months phone calls and texts in the middle of the night saying, hey, good job, you bastard, and that sort of thing. It's pretty, you can probably either go one way or the other way. Um, yeah. One way is to go deep down dark places where you sort of think of real bad stuff to do, and the other places go, fuck it, I'll show them. And I take it you took the fuck it path. Yeah, after about three months, I think the other part as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, and so I buggered off to um, took about six months to sort of wrap it all up, and I went to London in um, February the following year. Yeah. And I set up a business over there. Doing. Uh, it was actually property maintenance. So um, came out actually went over there and sold windows for a start, so I could afford the ticket to get over there. And um, I could sell windows, and, and I um, there's got not a, an awful lot that you don't know about windows, are they? No, but they're plastic windows, and I and I would have driven Jesus how many, how many miles over that sort of car. I had a um, shitty old fifteen hundred pound Vauxhall that I drive places, and I uh, won some award for the fastest to heat had a certain mark, and I got a five thousand pound bonus. And so I thought, bugger it, I'll uh, go and buy a white van and set up a property maintenance mm. business. Wow! And I involved things. I was um, washing cars, but the first thing that was pretty actually pretty spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, and then I ended up sort of, uh, last sort of dice at about £300 in the bank account and I bought a database off Yale.com, which is sort of yellow page over there, and sent out to all the uh, um, real estate services around that time um, to sort of offer them property services. And um, I tell you what, I've never been as busy, still to this day, for the following two weeks after that. And I made 14000 quid in my first month doing that, so it was more money than I'd ever made in a month over here. And so that was probably the best time in my life. It still probably is the best moment when, the, when those first phone calls started coming through because you've realised you sort of, I made a promise when I went broke that I'll be in business again within a year and that business started September the 1st, 2002. Now that's that's um, a statement that I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs. I mean, I've heard that, um, that statement <coughs> said within these walls. It happened, I went broke, but you give yourself a goal, something to, to, to work towards. Have you always worked in, in that kind of way? Pretty much, yeah. No, I was... I was reasonably competitive cyclist back in the day. Um, originally, when I left school in mid-sixth form, was I wanted to become a pro cyclist and then had a bad knee and realised that there was a lot of drugs in Europe. And so I, um, but I would, I would um, <laughs> so, you know, and not the right sort of drugs either. Um, and so I sort of, I used to always have goals and even on my helmet, you know, I'd have more goals written for the year, up and down it and that sort of stuff and pretty much ticked off, you know, most of them apart from probably the last couple. Okay. Have, you, have you done stuff like that for the remainder from then until now? Actually had something physically in front of you to remind you of what it is that you're wanting to achieve, written inside the helmet, a post-it note on the computer. Yep. On well, September the 12th, 2004, I wrote a, um, and she's still got it to this day, a laminated note. And I'd just gone down to Rotorua Estate, my dad's place, and it was about three in the morning and I couldn't sleep. And I was almost at the start of a setup finder. I'd had about 100 grand I came back with from London, and um, I was down to my probably last, like, two grand. I was thinking to myself, fuck it, I'm going broke again. Can you believe this? Like three years later, I'm going broke again. And so I wrote this goal sheet of the uh, next five years, and I did six things I'd achieve every single year. And I ticked off every single one of those apart from one. 
um, which was to have actually have a, have a proper kickboxing fight. Um, and I never got to have that one. That was a bit of random out, out there one. Probably take out a bit of anger. Anybody here that, that wants to finish off the Later on, have a couple more beers and we'll get on there. <laughs> this is generally the fight club going. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it was just random. It was, fight. it was down to, like, that's the car I'd buy at that point. That's the sort of flat I'd move to. And this time I'd meet um, the girl I'd marry, all that sort of stuff, and I just wrote it down. And, and I sort of had to because I, I got laminated, and the person who laminated it so I was the weirdest man in town because he's reading this thing as a laminate. Like, Fuck, <laughs> this guy's insane. But I needed that, and then it, that sort of pretty much came with me to um, every meeting for the probably next two years. I had it in a black folder. No one could see it, but I knew it was with me. And so I'd go yeah. out and I'd sort of, you know, sell my first lot of um, finder listings. You know, you go to some guy's house and you're nervous as hell, you know, throwing $94 of sharp cleaning um, out in sort of Metabank. I still remember to say, I took a photocopy of the cheque, I wanted to keep the cheque, but I couldn't afford to keep the cheque, so I had to bank the cheque, so I took a photocopy of it instead. And um, you sort of have it, and you sort of you do those little things, yeah. and you pull it out and go, that's what I've got. So I think goals are massively important, I always tell my kids to have goals, and even when they're six and four, and you know, we sort of, you know, this week we're going to get my um, you youngest, she's going, to do, she's going to do cartwheels, and she wants to do cartwheels, because that will get her to the next stage of gym, where she goes to, so, yeah. Good grief. I've got a 13 year old who's terrorising old ladies in Ponsonby <coughs> for sweets at the moment. <laughs> Nothing along those lines at all. Um, let's go back to 19 years old. Did you go to Farsadi? No, shit, no. I, thought it was, um, I originally wanted to be an architect. And then um, in fifth form, I stopped enjoying school because I thought it was very boring. They teach me a lot of shit. And then in sixth form, I really. really Phones good. off! That's amazing. I, thought, I didn't think I would need to say it to you <coughs> lot. If, if, you, if anybody else has their phone on, <coughs> now's the time to turn. <gasps> People are doing it as well. <laughs> I judge you. Yeah. I judge you all very harshly. Sorry, Jane, carry on. So, um, so no to varsity. You yeah, no. Um, and yeah, so I left school in, um, mentally midway through sixth form, part of cycling, and then um, physically at the end of sixth form. So, um, and I wasn't thick at school. Um, I was probably reasonably opposite. And I just said, I originally was going to be in business, and I didn't need to know trigonometry. So I said, fuck it, let's just leave school. And university, when I realised that architects needed five years, and I used to design houses and everything, and then, um, when I realised that varsity was going to be five years in, to be an architect, the bug of that, eventually what I'd rather do is I'd rather own the buildings rather than design them. It was sort of, a, I remember a clear thought in my head, I said, I'd rather why design them when you can actually go and own the building. That'd be a way better way to make some money. Um, <laughs> so from there you went overseas and found yourself with the white van and was there any inspiration that you discovered in a, a different culture? New Zealand does have a, a number of um, eight wire mentality and then we talk about tall poppy syndrome as well. Yep. Was it different? To, 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 no, to tall, work. Tall, tall puppy syndrome lies around New Zealand. Um, not so much in England because it's so big, you know, and you get over there and you sort of, you, you sort of blend in. Um, what I do know is that I can probably work, well, I think, harder than 99% of other people in the world, yeah. you know, just in terms of, you, you're just flat with a lot of guys and, you know, I didn't think uh, going to London and living in a one-bed flat with 12 people was that sort of fun, so I needed, I realised I needed to sort of earn a certain amount of money to have my own place and I wasn't going to get that working behind a bar, so I thought that's why I started selling windows um, yeah. again. Um, so yeah, no, but over there it's um you know it's, it's reasonably that time was 2001, so there was a lot of good work around and mm. and, the, and the reason I got into one of the property management businesses was because I was um, talking to a few guys in a pub and they were getting paid like 15 quid an hour and I sort of I just had a plumber because they had to fix a toilet at the flat the day before that and they'd come and charge us 90 quid an hour and I thought well 15 90 there's a big margin there so maybe I can do that. Um, and that's literally how it started. It was called One Services. It's probably is completely gone tits up now and. People probably trying to sue me as well, but um, for a different work. I did. But I did everything from painting houses, moving rocks out of a backyard, um, cutting roses, doing the you know the fancy hedges that go around when people have them tooled. Taperies. I just bought a book and learned it that night, and then went in and bought some scissors and I sort of carved this lady's um, Chelsea <laughs> sort of and, um, I remember her looking at me, just going, "You don't know that what the shit you're doing." And I was sort of like, "Man, this is cool." I have a little sort of polo with one service written on it. Um, but you do, you do a lot of things when you're keen. I mean, you just you just give it a crack. Are you still keen? I'm always keen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just I just give it a crack. Um, I think it's probably the biggest thing I I do. You know, I just I'm not really afraid of failure. Yeah. Um, as much as I am, because my biggest fear is probably failure. But I'm not afraid to give it a crack and have fail. And I think going through going broke, you know, that, that six months is still something which I probably think about too often. Um, you know, starts bringing up some sort of pretty sort of bad shit, um, and you're sort of the worst side of human nature. You know, I think of that. Um, so no, so I'm certainly not afraid to give it a crack because once you've been down the bottom, you can't go much further. Now, look, I'm going to ask you a few more questions um, just about that because it's easy to skim over the feeling of failure in, in a conversation like this. You know, we're throwing cliches all the time. We say things, oh, you, you get to rock bottom the only way. I think that's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can't hear. 
Yeah. Anyway, <gasps> sifts. Um, <laughs> failure. We talk about failure. Um, <laughs> but we do. We skim over these things quite often. And I've, I've had these conversations with entrepreneurs here. And you, you hear the, you know, you hit rock bottom, the only way back up uh, is back up. You, know, you fall off the bike, you get back on it again. But th there's something more than that. There, there, there has to be, um, a, a, I don't know, a mantra maybe, a, 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 a kick up the, the bottom that you give to yourself. How? How do, do you get past those gut-wrenching feelings of far out? Can I actually make this work? I think it's, um, I think it's ingrained in you. So I've always been a pretty determined kid. Um, Mum will tell you I was a pain in the ass um, for probably the first five or six years of, of my life. Um, I've never thought that anything is too big to conquer, too hard, too hard to run. You know, I might have been six years old running around the Mount at Mount Monganui or doing whatever. Um, so I think it's probably ingrained. You know, I think you come back to that early thing I said. You, you either got if you go broke or have a bad sort of situation, you got two choices. You can either live, let it kill you or let it, um, you know, just turn around and go. Well, shit, shit happens. Mm. And um, as hard as it is, because you go to some pretty dark times. I mean, I've, I've sort of been rumoured driving to Rotorua sometimes. You know, where you're sort of thinking about so much stuff that happens, and you can get texts thrown through some some guy saying, "Ah, oh, ha, ha, you bastard." I was thinking, oh man, is this, is this actually worth sort of living? Um, but then you say, fuck it, I'll come back, and I enjoy seeing those people now. Um, it's quite cool because you, you've done a couple of things, you know, and for so long I wouldn't have talked. I mean, I would not be sitting here talking about going broke. I probably had it until I have to find it. Yeah. And then it didn't matter because I had something to um, come back with them and say, well, actually, look at what I've done, what have you done since then? Yeah. So, mm. na, 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 na. A little bit of that, yeah. That's yeah. why I came back from London. I had a good business over there going well, and I said, to be honest, no one could see me. And I wanted to come back and prove to those pricks who um, say that sort of stuff. And I call them pricks because I think some of those people are, you know. Um, if, if guys, if you go through failure, I think in US, you know, there's a whole thing that if you go and fail in US, it's um, looked upon as a bit of a, I don't know, something sort of to be, you know, yeah, I've been, your I went broke once, that's awesome. And over here, it's completely the opposite. It's yeah. sort of like, oh, you're an absolute dickhead, you went broke, you, you dork, you know, unless you're trying to push you down to the, you know, get, put your head on the floor and we'll stomp on it a bit more um, as well. It's got to change, I think, in this country. Yeah, it has. I think it has changed. Um, so we was just saying that it's, it's been, it was ingrained in you, but can anybody be an entrepreneur? Can anybody take an idea that's been niggling in the back of their head and turn it around? Or does it take a specific type of personality? I think anyone can do it. Anyone can do anything. Um, tell my kids that. You know, Jesus, was I going to be a... Who would have thought I went to the World Champs as a cyclist when I was 19? I was, I'm a big... You know, I'm a tall... Too, too heavy for cycling and that sort of stuff, but you just go in there and you go, fuck it, I can, I can ride a bike quick, and you just figure out, you know, and you just figure out how to do it. Um, and I, I think anything like that, I mean, it might sound sort of hard case and blase, but I, I think honestly anyone can do anything. I and think what we're learning here is nothing really has to be difficult if you don't make it. I mean, you think, you think of businesses, and there's <clears throat> businesses go broke at the time. I mean, I went broke in Windows, but I mean, I know some dudes who have made some serious multi-million dollars, you know, out of making out on your Windows. Um, they, they just had a good business. There's businesses that go broke every day. There's other businesses in the same industry that actually thrive and succeed and yeah. people make massive amounts of money. So I think it's a mental sort of thing. You came back from, <coughs> from London knowing what to do with Windows. How did Finder come about? I sat down for a month in a flat I had which I couldn't really afford in a room and said I've got to come up with some idea. My first idea was actually making smoothies and it's kind of called, we called Halo Smoothies. Um, and until I realised that I was going to make 40 cents a pottle which is not enough to make a business, I can tell you that. Um, so I said, bugger that. And then I sat down, I actually, just before I left London, I bought a domain name called matesinlondon.com. And that was gonna be called, uh, sort of essentially like Gumtree, that was the sort of thing. Everyone's been to the uh, UK, you know, uses the Gumtree. And um, so I decided I'll, I'll build, build the Gumtree, because it's something I use. So Does I everybody here know what Gumtree is? <coughs> yeah? Yep. Um, so I sort of um, registered Finder, and I sat down and said, okay, I'll use Finder. And then I, um, by the end of the sort of, it was on February the 14th, 2004, Four, it was. Romantic. Um, um, yeah, no, I, I remember all these sort of dates, um, don't know, transporting sort of stuff. And then just sat down and said, okay, let's, by the end of the first year, I'd, I'd spent, and I bought about 70 domain names, find a property, find a plumber, find all this sort of shit, and um, started about building it. And I literally thought, and this is how, how funny I work, I thought, cool, I'll start coding it. That's cool, you know, I didn't know shit about coding, so I went to the. You went borders, and got a book? Went to Borders, yeah, bought a book, uh, <laughs> and it was called Dummies for Coders, I think it was. I think, <laughs> Dummies for Code, or whatever, it was one of those books, anyway. And I, um, Dreamweaver it was, I was using Dreamweaver, and I got home and um, I read the book for a week, realised that was a bit tough, so I went and um, signed up to a course that was run out of um, the Alexandra Race Park, and I did that for a week and I realised I was pretty shit at coding, and um, <laughs> so I went to a, um, a couple of development companies, and they were going to charge me 80 grand to do it, didn't quite have 80 grand to spend, I thought it was pretty ridiculous, 
So I put an ad in the paper, um, back in those days you did put ads in paper, 2004 still, and I ended up getting a, um, a roving uh, English um, traveller, and he uh, charged me 16 grand. A gypsy, grand to essentially. Pretty much, yeah, he, he still lives in Rotorua, funny enough. So he, <laughs> how, how, how like is that? So I was going to Rotorua back and forth, so I lived in Auckland and I'd go to Rotorua to see mum and dad all the time. And um, he was travelling from the south, so I, we hooked it up over line, did that, and then he ended up stopping in Rotorua. He still lives there, got a great web development business. Um, Royston Bartholomew is his name. And um, he had a, had a, he's got a good little business down there, and he developed it for me. And um, so I'd go down every week, and I'd see him, and we'd update it. And then after about six months, it got done, and 16 grand later, it was um, on a working website, which is pretty cool. Far out. So how long was um, Finder lurking around for before Grubbun turned up? Finder was about five years. Um, Two years real hard slog, did a deal with um, APN, that went pretty good. Did they come to you? No, I went to them, because I was, I was actually had a deal, um, this shows you how funny things go, and why, why I'd never sort of give up on things. So I was spending probably, probably 10 months with ACP, you know ACP magazines, now Bauer magazines, and I spent 10 months with them trying to do a deal because we had Finder and I was going to be like Water Trader and that sort of stuff, and it was going to be real, and we were going to do a whole lot of shit and it was going to be cool. A 10 month deal this time? <clears throat> I spent 10 months working with these guys, and it got to the stage where I was accepting, I actually signed a um, term sheet with them, um, they went to the supposed the board, I now know it's probably a whole lot of shit because the board uses just this random thing. But it, um, and I, I ended up accepting it for $120,000 a year salary and that was it. So I got to the sta st stage where I was that worn down, I was like, I'll take it. <coughs> Came back from the board, they didn't fucking accept it. So I was sitting there going, man, so I remember coming home to a little place I had and my now um, my then girlfriend, now wife, had her parents around. And I walked in and walked straight past them, said, grab the keys and I've got to go for a fucking drive. And so I hopped in my car and drove for probably about three hours and just said, I am literally going to go broke again. This is, this is ridiculous. You know, a year ago I wrote these goals out that I wasn't going to go broke. And, um, <coughs> and so I came home the next day and I said, well, you know, you, you can either let these things kill you or go up. So I sent a few more emails the next day. I sent one to um, APN, who I'd met the previous week. And uh, four weeks later, I signed a deal where they put in one and a half million bucks for 50% of the business. So you think, you know, in the space of four weeks, you go from signing away everything you worked for, getting 120 grand salary, 80 grand with the debt store, to pay off over probably God knows how long, to then getting one half million dollars put in, your, in the finder bank account. Six months later after that, we merged it with um, UBD Infomedia, which was a 130 person business, making sort of losses of probably a couple hundred grand a month. Um, I fixed it up, we got it down from 140 staff to 65, and then eight months after that, I sold it back to APN for um, a really good chunk of cash. Suckers. And it was just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it's, it's, um, it's funny, you know, because you're sort of even, even now talking about it, you think, shit, you know, it's just 18 months. Do of you just going, look back? Wait, here always, we are, yeah. Do you look back and go, far out? Yeah. Shit, I've done good. Yeah. Every night I think about going broke. And I, and, and I think about most other things as well, but I, every night I remember what, what it was like going broke. Yeah. So I wake up in the morning, driving to work, telling everyone, you know, pulling into room, into room, I've gone broke, sorry, you know, I can't afford to pay your holiday pay. If you go home tonight, I probably can't afford to pay your mortgage, really sorry about that. Um, crying in front of them, that sort of stuff. You, you sort of, I go through that every day, but I use that more now as, um, as sort of like, like a bit of a chuckle to yourself, to be fair. You sort of sit there going, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty shit, eh? Hey? Um, but then you sort of manage to come through. If that, if you'd taken the 120, if you'd taken that $120,000 salary, if they'd, if they'd come back, walk, come back and said, yeah, all right. Yeah. Would you still be doing that? No, shit, no. Jesus, no. That would have been a means to an end. It was a way to get out of a situation, it would have been. Yeah. To be fair. Yeah. It, okay. was, it was when things get that bad that you're going, oh, I just have to take this. Yeah. 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 I think I knew the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, from where? From there? Uh, so there we um, sold that business to Yellow Pages, and then I went and set up a, um, I tried to do something like an ID, called IDA HQ, which is like, like an incubator, so we invest in a few things. And, and I realised one thing about it, I'm really a shit ass investor, um, to be fair. Um, you know, I'm not very good at having minority stakes and things. Yeah. And so that's probably changed. I sort of um, had a few things that we did. And then we sort of concentrated on seller for probably a good year and a half, because that was the only thing that I sort of had a decent, decent stake in. And um, that was going really well until I started seeing a sort of model called Groupon coming out of the States. And I'd raised you know, $30 million at a $250 million valuation. Four months later, they raised uh, $120 million at a $1.2 million valuation. And I was like, you know, I've got to do this. This is in April 2010. And I sort of just was half high, sort of, you know, what should I do, what should I do? Because I was with APN, and I was sort of half shares in the incubator. And um, I remember sitting there, and it was one weekend in July, um, no, Queen's birthday weekend, um, Saturday night. And I woke up, and the time was 3 a.m. on the clock. And I just had this thing that said, if I don't do it, someone else, some other bastard is going to go and do it and make a whole lot of money and really piss me off. So we went in that weekend. Yeah. Um, went in that weekend on the Queen's birthday, was the Monday. Printed out the entire group on, you know, screenshot it, did the whole entire walls. And then when the guys came in, we had about eight people working for sale at that time. 
and um, so we had about six developers. So they were working on something completely different? Yeah, we were going to sell it. Yeah, so we had, we had a good chunk of people working on Seller, and Seller was growing really well. I, I'd love to see where that would have gone if we could have kept the same momentum, because it was actually going really well. Not a lot of people believe me in that, but I know deep down it was going good. <laughs> um, and then I just said, guys, I've got two choices. I can't afford to keep funding Seller. My last throw of the dice, literally, I, I didn't tell them, tell them the amounts, but I pretty much had 300 grand before I'd start selling shit that I didn't want to sell. So I said, let's put 300 grand into this thing and, and go for it. And we, um, I said, we'll launch it in four weeks' time. And so we literally stopped working on Sally completely, and we launched it in four weeks after that. Now you've been asked this question in a number of different things um, before. To be able to do a complete 180, to, to, to put something that you've been working heart and soul on to one side, to make those changes, those decisions, really, really quickly. Mm. How do you do that? What kind of um, risk analysis do you, do you run through? What, what kind of due diligence do you give yourself? The cool answer to that is zilch. <laughs> um, but the reality is, I think in everything I've probably thought of A to Z, yeah. and I just don't probably verbalise it a hell of a lot to people. Um, and that thing I just took the view of, I'd rather be number one at something, because I knew with Trade Me, you know, sort of had a big hold on that sort of market. So we're not even going to be a, a, a sort of ratchet number two. You know, be five percent of the market, you yeah, good business, or we could go into this business and have a chance of hitting number one. And I thought, well, that's worth the risk of doing it. Mm. And I think in this thing, all around the world, Group One is becoming number one. They're expanding very quickly, so we've got to do it really now. If we and, and, our, and when we launched, you know, Jesus, I had a few guys in there who um, took me to the room. Um, two of them are here tonight, so I can say them. And, and I was just, look, we, you know, sales going good. We're getting ten grand a month in revenue, that sort of stuff. You know, I think what you're doing is a bit sort of crazy. I said, fuck it. Well, if we're wrong, we're wrong. But uh, you know, let's give it a crack. Um, and our first model that we put through to APN to do it was we'd do, I think it was, um, and the guy here who correct me tonight, I think it was $16,000 in commission in December um, to do it. I think we did 600000 after six months. So it was so, like, beyond comparison to how it launched. It was um, insane. But we launched in four weeks. Our first help desk was a, an email address that went to some guy's Gmail. He answered about 500 um, help desk tickets in his first day. Um, it was very, very, very basic. But for that sort of model, it was speed is king. Um, absolutely. And the, here's a question that um, some of you out in the audience wanted me to ask you, if it's in nicely here. Um, what do you do when you look at a, a market and you think, there's an opportunity, and yet what you've done thus far is quite, not necessarily generic, but it covers off a big slice, and yet people have often put you into a niche, saying that you, uh, you're a tech guy, you're an online guy. Um, what do you see out there in terms of the opportunities? Well, I started a pet because I bought a dog and I realised there's no online sort of thing I could buy it. So that's, that's starting me on a I've got a dog. Well, starting on, <laughs> it started me on a world going, okay, well, yeah, should animates have a website? No. Okay, it does. So you start looking at things and going, okay, so overseas, 10% of the market, the people buying things on a dog. We spend, you know, one half billion dollars a year on pets. It's 150 million should be going through. Currently, we're spending 0.4%. Okay, that's a bit of a thing there. I could, I could be a bit of a fool and say, Probably business could be fifteen, twenty million dollars untapped demand there if you get it going and do it right. So things like Grab One, it was a case of well, there's a, one of the market we daily do. Groupie just launched, um, which Lance Wiggs had done about a month before that. Um, funny story for another time behind that name of that thing. And then um, yeah, and it was sort of one of those things that you know. I always would say to the guys, if you got through to Christmas without Trade Me or um, One Day Torpedo Seven launching, would be right. And they launched in sort of March and April, and of course we were fine. Um, we were too big by that stage to get through. But I think if Trade Me had launched in October, I think it would be a different story. Yes, yeah, um, sliding doors, eh? Mm. Sliding doors. When it comes to um, to these great ideas that you, you've had and continue to, to keep on recognising and, and developing, is there an exit strategy? Do you ever think of something with to? I'm going to start this, we're going to get two years into it, and this is where I'd like that to go. Or do you feel your, your, your way as you, as you go along? Is it an ever-evolving beast, or is it something History, that you think you've got an end goal History's probably shown. Um, I don't think there are any new ideas, um, but I, I, I often get a, a few comments people say, oh, you just copied Groupon. It's like, yeah, well, fuck, Stephen Tindall probably copied the Walmart, you know? Um, a petrol station in New Zealand looks pretty similar to a petrol station in Los, you know, Los Angeles or London or wherever yeah. you go. So, I think no idea is generically new. I think every idea gets tweaked. Um, and then if it's that easy, why don't you do it yourself um, and bring these things down? So, um, so yeah, I mean, you look, at, you look at these different ideas and you just look at it, but um, I don't know, I just, I just, I don't know, it's, what, it's sort of, you just go and do it, I think. I mean, I, I don't think too much. And I think, you know, if you're the sort of guy, I always imagine myself as me sort of running over the sort of hill first, you know, and there's people sort of shooting or something, and you sort of, I'm, I'm the first person to sort of go, fuck it, guys, let's go running. 
and then I get sort of trampled about within about three metres, but I've sort of got everyone across the line and got the momentum going. I think yeah. that's sort of my, my skill set. So there's big barriers to entry, but I mean, if there's a block wall, I'd, I'd genuinely think you could probably punch enough times and it probably will break down. Um, it might take it two years, one year, six months, whatever, but I don't really tend to see, um, I don't really tend to see issues. You know? And in terms of X strategy, does that long term? Um, yeah, shit, I mean, I, going broke at 23, that, that probably changes your mindset. I mean, I got an offer for that business when I was 20 for uh, $240,000 in Rotorua. Now, I would have been a 20 year old, $240,000 six years ago. I oh, know it's probably close to 600 grand right now. Um, after, and, I, and I didn't take it, and two years later I was completely stuffed and broke. So I look at it and go, well, if you create a bit of value these days, just sell it. So yeah, maybe I sold grab one too early, maybe I sold fine too early, but fuck it, you know. Um, I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather have, you know, I've been pretty comfortable since age 30. Um, uh, yeah, the kids are sorted, the wife's sorted, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, they're all sorted for the rest of my days, and that's to me more important than anything else. When I get to probably, you know, the business I'm setting up now, sure, I can, I can take a bit longer term and think of that, but I'm going to have a nice life doing it. I, I'm sort of not one of these guys who's going to spend 30 years, you know, living in a, in a squalor to have a business where I sell for a billion dollars and I'm 70. And it's like, well, what the fuck's the point of that? You know, you might as well enjoy it where you're there and you've got kids and that sort of stuff, so um, have a good life where you're doing it. See, when I think of being comfortable, I just think of big knickers and track pants with elasticated waists. Mate, Barker's trackies, they are the key. They are. I've got a vintage pair that I bought from, <laughs> from a second hand shop and possibly yep. for like $30. God, I'm an idiot. Um, here's, here's another question that um, somebody out there um, wanted to know. When you're talking about sort of knocking on the door and, and keep on going, in those early days of potentially having absolutely nothing, it's the, the absolute dollar bill, the bottom line dollar to bill that you need to keep on, um, that you need to have in order to pay for, for everything. Mm. Did you have investors? If so, where did Jesus. they come from? How did you make that happen? Because so this is a massive issue for so many entrepreneurs. Yes, yeah, so with Finder, when I got to the stage of living 10 days, I had a block of cheese and a loaf of bread in the freezer. I lived off that. And I could have, to be honest, I could have easily caught up my dad and said, can I, can I borrow a thousand bucks? And I said, no, fucking, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that this time. I'm just going to literally live off this block of, block of cheese and a loaf of bread. <laughs> and um, it's quite tasty. If you can do a few different ways, you can do it. You know, grilled, you can get a toasty. Um, and I just did it at a point, because I look back in those times now, and it's funny, you know, I was living actually in, um, mum and dad had an apartment in, in the city, and at this point I was sort of renting it off them, and, and it was a, you know, dollars a week, because I was paying sort of for the room, because they used to come up and see me, that sort of stuff. And it was a really nice apartment, <laughs> I remember sitting there going, one night sitting in this place going, you know, this bar is quite nice, and I'm, you know, here's my toasted sandwich, you know, for the night. And I just did it at a pure, if I'm going to do it, I'll do it my own way. Because yeah. um, I really think, and I was talking about this with some, someone earlier on, you know, when I get through to 70, 80, I can know I made it from dollar, to be honest, dollar minus probably half a million bucks, um, not dollar one or dollar two. I didn't really get any handouts from things. Um, I could have easily have done that, I think, yeah. in a lot of things, and that's the easy road. Um, I borrowed, had borrowed some money from mum and dad from Design House. The happiest day of my life is when I made some money and paid them back. How have you coped with the attention that you, you, you've had? Everybody knows your name. Everybody see, knows what you've done. You know, I know I hated um, anything. Cool. Because obviously, I went broke, and I didn't want anyone to see me. And that's because I thought I had creditors literally calling me up you know, and saying, "Hey, you know, you owe me thirty thousand dollars. Please pay me." Um, until I know I'll bug it. You know, shit happens. Um, this sort of business, you know, I have things where people go broke on me now, and you go, "Well, it's just you know, grab one of those people going under, and you go, well, it's just part of course of business." Mm. Um, in terms of that, I went to a, um, I don't know, if, I think it was 2004, there was a um, Thrive, <coughs> hit the RTS Square and had like um, Thrive Auckland or whatever, sort of like one of these, probably one of the first sort of conferences where they bring people in. Murray Thompson was there, and um, I saw see that guy because he lives down um, Tumpy Drive on Coe Beach, and he's the guy who did, you know, piano by candlelight, and um, he just talked for 45 minutes, and I tell you what, I was so inspired when I left that building, I, I, I said, man, you know, that's just, that's just awesome because he told me it was hard times and shit times and that sort of stuff, and I said, well, if we can get to that sort of stage, I'll go and do it. I, I, I hate the sort of, um, you know, you, you'll, you don't see me on Facebook, I never post photos of kids and that sort of stuff. It's just, I, I keep that sort of, well, you know, even Chris Keel said to me, so you never talk about your sort of outside, because well, I talk to you about business, I don't need to talk mm. about the other shit. I think that's sort of not my thing. Um, and, and you sort of look at it and I say, well, you can never talk to a few people, and there's, there's hard times in business. I mean, business is, is just shit. I mean, um, it really is. I mean, I love it in this country where everyone who thinks you've got a business thinks you're instantly wealthy. You know, if you're at school and you're, and you, your parents got a business there, I was like, oh, you must be loaded or rich or something. And it's like, fuck no, no. It's actually, I would guarantee that probably 90% of business owners are making less than the people they employ. Do you feel that you've got a good work-life balance now? Yeah. Has absolutely. it always been that way? Because we, we talked about um, no, the girlfriend get, becoming the wife. Yeah, I didn't get married. So I, I got married, um, 
what, you know, in 2005, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, 2005, met my wife and we got married in 2008. I just sold Finder before that. The actual reason I sold, sold Finder is my um, eldest daughter was about to be um, uh, born. Um, she was born on October uh, 23rd. And I was hacking over AP and over price, and it was like half a million bucks. And the scheme of things is like, you're going from having like two grand in bank account to having literally like lots of money. And I remember coming home and she looked at me, as, and, it's, and she's going to speak obviously, and she's looking at me, what the fuck are you doing, Dad? You're a dork. And so I literally called up the guy, that guy Warren Lee, that night and said, yeah, okay, well, I'll take it. And the skill will get it done. That was done before Christmas. And um, so, I, so you definitely change your sort of goals. And I've made this sort of call that, you know, you could make more money by having businesses based in San Fran and traveling three months a year, four months a year. But I'd rather wake up when I'm 18 and look back and say, I've probably spent more of my time with my kids and that sort of stuff. So I, I think, you know, hey, let's say you're worth 200 million when you're 18. You go, well, if I'd done actually everything else when I was not doing as much as we were with 50, you've still got an amazing mm -hmm. life. And I get home every night from the kids. I see, um, I see them for uh, bed. You know, I call them on the way down here. Um, I, had, I had to test travel, not because I had phobia of fucking flying and that sort of stuff. Um, I just hate being away from the kids. You know, Skype's bollocks. And I'll be like, oh, I Skype my kids away for two weeks. And I'll Skype's shit. You know, you know, <laughs> I, I want to be there and read the story. You know, so I'll, so I get home in the morning and. Um, there we, are ovaries switching left, right, and centre around there right now. <laughs> well, you know, we, we have we have brick every morning. Um, the best weekend for me is having to move night with the kids on Saturday night, and, and that's I think that's the coolest thing. So, I admire guys out there doing the hard yards. I mean, mm. there's guys out there. Um, you know, I look at some of these dudes. And I won't name the names because it's on video, and they'll bring me up tomorrow and go, "Fucking bastard!" But you know, they're travelling. They're right? they've got young kids and they're travelling all the yeah. time and stuff. And I go, I don't know if you look back when you're 18, go, it's worth it. Because yeah. you don't you don't need a bigger house. I mean, you get a big house, you don't need a bigger one. Um, is it worth it? And actually, for an interesting, um, I'll say this because it was on public record, but Gretchen Hawksby um, talked about, I think, and I don't read very often, but the Herald on Sunday had this, um, the flip, you know, 12 questions. And Gretchen was talking about um, Graham Hart, and he was saying now, now he takes more time off than what he did when she was younger. So he sort of, and he says to his, um, her wife, um, Duncan Hawksby, I think his name is, about how, you know, you've got to sort of just choose what you want out of life. And I always look at things, and I wonder how many guys who get to 85 and they might be in their last few months of living going, you know, fuck that 10 years I spent probably wasn't the best thing. You know, my kids, yeah. when I'm and 40, you can't, because get it back. you can't. I mean, my, my kids are six and four. You know, when I'm 40, and the plan's been 10 and eight, and I'll start taking, um, you know, out the school holidays, or it'll just be where, we, where do we go? And I'd rather have that than um, setting up another, you know, 12 businesses and making some more money. I don't think it gets to a point where it's just not worth it. Aside from the beautiful children and the, um, the lovely wife, What's been the thing that you've actually bought yourself and thought, shiny, fast, <laughs> sexy, you guys ain't got one? <laughs> um, I, uh, I like stuff like that, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it to a room, and, you know, I bought a few things and then I bought something a week ago, but I'd never say to people, I don't sort of trust the things, what it, what it was. Um, I enjoy buying things because you sort of, you want them for the, you know, the last thing I bought last week, go, it's not buying it for me, it's buying it because there's a family going to have a yeah. square front on it. Um, I do love my cars, but that's something. I mean, I bought one car, and it's just cool, um, and I, I like that. But it's not—it's not a sort of materialistic sort of shit. Yeah. I think I think that sort of stuff is. Um, you guys are going to buy. Oh, no, fucking, I used to always want a Lamborghini, and you look at it and go, really? What the fuck do you want a Lamborghini for? Because you see some guy driving it, and you go, man, you're a puller. You know, he's, <laughs> cruising on, <laughs> he's cruising on Mission Bay on a Sunday, and you look at it and go, you just feel like picking up the water and just chucking it, and going, man, what a dork. But hey, good on them. If they want to do it, that's, that's their thing. No, it's, it's, it's funny. We, we talk about measures of success, and um, I, I always knew that you would talk about your family like that, and, and God only knows most people here would do. Um, I just heard a, a, such a lovely story um, quite, quite a wee while ago from a, a young entrepreneur who was in and out of here, and um, he told me just on the quiet that he felt that he had truly, truly made it when um, he could say that he had one pair of shoes for goods and one pair of shoes for casual because up until that point he'd literally been walking in the same pair of shoes mm. since he had from walking out of university halfway through. I'll tell you what, and something I something I still think of every time I, and I don't do it often, the grocery shopping. And I love swiping the card and not looking at the And money. not going, please, <coughs> please don't decline, please yeah. don't decline, please don't decline. And because I've had that multiple times and it's not, not good and I like swiping it and then I always try to tell the kids there's not a lot of people who can swipe the card and not think about it because I sort of go out and go how much have I fucking spent it you know like shopping you look at it's fucking 340 dollars it's ridiculous you know, where does all shit come from um, and I, I reckon that's probably one of the things I think about on a you know regular cruise or taking them out for brickie on a Sunday morning I think that's the coolest thing um, this morning I you know, dropping um, trying to drop sort of the uh, elders off at school and we stop at 
Jens a place in Rimuru where they know us and we walk in and go, yeah, cool, same again, mocker and a, um, and a hot choppy, and I think that's probably the best. You know, I love it when the oldest goes to school because it'll be sort of, it's like the hour in the morning where you sort of sit in the traffic talking a bit of shit. It's amazing how much shit you talk about with a six year old, let me tell you. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's the cool things, um, being able to do that. Well, let me just reassure really you that they turn into teenagers and there's no talking. I know, I keep hearing No it. talking, it's bloody horrible. Mm. Um, now, here's, here's a couple of questions that I'm particularly interested in. Um, marketing, taking your product to market, um, it's not necessarily something that we're all instantly fantastic at. It's you know what you want to produce, you know what you want to um, create, but how do you actually deliver that to the people who are going to be buying or using that? That's Make it a good product. Um, I think the thing with um, anything is you can we can waste your time on sort of marketing sort of expenditure and stuff. But if you make a good product, so you think grab one we made a good product that worked and people could go and buy a four dollar movie ticket on the first day and we sold ten thousand in I think three hours or whatever it was. Was um, that a conscious thing? That that four dollar um, movie ticket? Oh, yeah, it yeah, I saw got it in, um, people's attention. Yeah, I saw it. Instantly. I saw it happening um, from a company called. Um, City, City Deals, um, the guys at the scene where the brothers set up in London and they'd done a movie ticket thing for £3 I think it was and it had just gone ballistic and we said let's do that. So we went and bought um, 10,000 and we tr turned it on the first day as a test and we sold 3,000 hour and a half and I was like man just turn this freaking thing off because I can't afford to buy any more tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went and bought some more tickets and 10,000 and um, by that next day it was just went nuts and um, we ended up that first day, I think we had 35,000 on the database by the end of the first day and uh, you can just see it going through offices, I mean your registration like you know, some of ASB, 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 and BNZ, 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 BNZ. Um, pretty cool feeling, and pretty mm. worrying feeling as well. Um, but it was, but it was also, <laughs> my, my biggest mistake in grabbing was not buying 50,000 tickets, to be honest. Wow. Because um, that would have just kept going um, as well, so. Yeah. Wow. And how, how did you play the media at this time? Because it garnered an awful lot of attention mm. from um, various business websites and, and um, Certainly, I, I can remember seeing it on. I think it might have been breakfast or. Yeah, we, we got heaps there for that. Um, it was just a new thing. I think at the right time, right place. I mean, it was a pretty shit time in 2010. I mean, the economy wasn't exactly oh, great, was it? Nine up to its awful. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, everyone was looking at ways to save money, and I think it was a new thing. That's so why Groupon probably went so crazy in 08 when it launched. Uh, sorry, 09, because um, it was a way to save money and, and that sort of stuff. Um, it was just, it was just different. And now, of course, the whole deal thing is. Um, I mean, 60% of the grocery stuff is bought on special. And it's like, so that's, a, that's a huge amount. I mean, it's, mm. you know, it's what, $16 billion he goes through the two supermarket chains. So you think, you know, almost $10 billion is going through, it's only when it's marked down to half off or whatever else it might be. Um, shit out's game, uh, to be honest, because we've, we've just trained the market to be, we only look at things, you know, when it's like 60% off. You know, it's the Briscoe's model, the Kathmandu model. So um, I think Grab at that time was, was sort of right place, right time. Mm. I think if you launched it in a, in a boom times, Business probably wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been as keen, but you know we became the lifeblood for some businesses. Yeah, um, I, I know that New Zealand being the, the you know, it's, it's the land of, of small independent business owners, and it, I know it's made a difference to a lot of people that um, we know around here. So we talked a little bit about um, your pet website, mm. and we've just discussed how um, the Kathmandu and Briscoe's model, um, you know, does great guns when it's doing sales. Where do you get this information from? I mean, you bought a dog. You thought it was a great idea to have a pet website, but yeah. everything else is there research there? Is there? No, so I, think, I think I'm just quite curious by nature. So you start looking at it and you, you dive in. You spend two grand to buy a Euromond report, and it's like, who the hell would spend two grand to buy a Euromond report? And it's like, well, I had a bit of interest there, and you sort of look at it and go, it's 0.4 percent, 10 percent. What the market is? Shit, that's actually a good idea. I, I know I can build a good website. Um, and one of these things, just, I just think all this sort of stuff just starts. I think like that. I mean, that's sort of mm. I got a guy and started doing some more things. And before you know it, we've sort of got a real live website delivering dog food. And we've got 600 grand with a dog fishing in Highbrook and realised that's probably a little bit too much. And um, you know, it's pretty, pretty hard to sort of measure, I suppose, all those sort of things. And here we are, sort of, we're now in Aussie. And we launched here just in August, um, late August. And um, that's going really well. And we're in New Zealand and we're you know, growing pretty much 10, 15 percent month on month, which is really cool. We'll do baby next year. Um, we'll just keep doing it, yeah. So, so, so obviously you, you got bought a dog, started a pet website, had a few kids, let's do the baby thing. Um, is that essentially the same model, but instead of... Yes, it's, food, it's just it's a baby. selling shit online, I suppose. And it's, um, it's actually not that hard when you look at it. And, and you, sort of whether you're selling a chair or sort of fake grass, whatever it may be, um, it's still you put it online and you do some things and where you go. Same as, you know, like Grabon was just putting a deal online and you create a coupon and mm. with pet you sort of make sure you have a box with the right products delivered to the right person. Um, a few more intricacies in doing products um, 
slightly harder yeah. um, as well. And, and, and I partnered pretty early on with the warehouse because you realised you sort of need existing scale to be able to buy these things. I mean, I could have gone and raised 10 million bucks from God knows whoever, but it still wouldn't allow me to buy nappies cheaper than someone else could. So you sort of realised I needed to buy existing scale. Um, so the um, partnership with the warehouse relies on their distribution chain and, and their... No, not, not distribution, no? more, more their sourcing. Right. Be because they can, they already buy a truckload of nappies, so I can piggyback that pricing and, and, and do that through me. So, like, not not me, but you know, um, combined as a group of, of a team, we can build a reasonable website. You know, we get people going to it. Um, I'm pretty anal about making sure we deliver um, product on time and stuff, which back to the service, and you sort of find just we're getting from gross. And then, as long as you have the right pricing, because it's pretty hard to buy something, you know, ten dollars when the warehouse is selling at a $10.10 10, yeah. and you've got to deliver it, courier and sort of stuff for the same price. So now we can buy it at you know, six bucks and make sure make a margin on it. You're doing um, <coughs> everything online at the moment. Have you ever thought about producing something that's I'd not lurking inside space? Yeah, no, I, um, I would love to get back into sort of just... Windows! Probably not Windows. Oh. Um, I did have a long <laughs> held ambition to get into Windows again and I always thought if I ever make... Uh, to be honest, if I ever sell a business that makes... I don't know, mega bucks. Um, if I was Sam Morgan, I would put $30 million in the window business just to piss off people. I tell you what, I will never understand this, and you can take this one home with you, darling. New Zealand, there's a lot of rain here, and yet you guys double glazing, central heating. Why Why not? Hey, it's just a bit of an idea. Do you want to go 50 50? Yeah, no, yeah, it could be, yeah. You want to a million bucks each, I suppose. Sweet, yeah. back pocket. Here, yeah. there you go. Um, yeah, no, so, so I, I enjoy, I think, the older businesses. Um, I, the other thing I've thought about is, you know, Getting older, I mean, shit, I've just turned 36 and you're grey haired and more fucking receding hairlines and that sort of stuff. And all the smart guys seem to be wanting to get into an online business. And I mean, I know some guys who are doing an upholstery business making 800 grand a year. And you're sitting there going, it's fucking upholstery, like it's, it's like this. But not many people are doing it. Yeah. And so they're charging whatever the frigging they want. Whereas all of the sort of guys tend to say, you know, people going, oh, I want to set up a business, and it's going to be this, and I want to online this and online that. And it's like, well, actually, just go and make some shit that a lot of people want. And Something tangible. Something tangible, yeah. So, so I'm involved in business in Aussie, which is quite an old school sort of business. Um, and I'll do a couple over here, which is sort of, you know, I do a bit more um, property shit these days. I grew up around property with my parents and my brother, and so I enjoy that. Um, and I sort of do on, on, online sort of things, um, I suppose, too. But I think they become less and less as I yeah. get older, to be honest. Yep. Easy. Easy. Um, do you think that there's a, a definite change in trends there? For people to well, eventually come away from business on, on, online and no, I think I think online is here to stay. It's more a case of me looking at going, you know, why go into a, I don't know, a field where there's 40 really really smart dudes doing things and there's two over here doing things. It's like, well, I might go over there because it's going to be going to be slightly easier. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, but I think in that sort of stage is a case of probably there's a lot of businesses out there, which you know you start talking to the guys and they're 65, their son doesn't want it because the son wants to come into, to be honest. You know, they've got a great business out at um, Rosebank Road or East Tamaki and it's making a million bucks a year. The son doesn't give a shit about it. He wants to come in and drink coffees at 10 o'clock with his glamorous. friends wearing the cool fancy clothes and work in the cool places, you know, like mm. sort of around here or in the city. And um, and it's just, I think it's just changing times. I mean, yeah. um, I love I love the warehouse factor of pet. And when I say the warehouse, I mean walking out there, you feel touch things, you've got people running around on forklifts and shit. I reckon that's cool. I reckon it's that shit that makes stuff move. Um, you know, being in an office somewhere in a big tower, um, getting paid some money, yes, it's a bit freaking bland, to be fair. Um, interesting, so all these, all these guys who are 665 have made a lot of money, they're sitting there going, well, I need to actually sell this business to someone, I don't want to see my life work 30 years ago to no one. Um, what do I do to it? I think there's a big opportunity in those sort of mm. things too. But you've got to have existing capital to go and buy those. You can't walk up to some dude and go, mate, I'll take it over for a dollar. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not going to work. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I'm Stokes, and I hope that you guys have enjoyed this just as much as I have. Now, <coughs> just before I drinking choke myself, champagne. <coughs> I think that's what's wrong, drinking water instead of this. <laughs> and she comes right. Um, Shane, thank you. We really do appreciate um, you, you coming along. I mean, as you said, it's not easy being in the limelight, having people constantly asking you questions. But in this sort of situation, I'm, I'm sure that you've um, enjoyed sharing mm, no, um, your, your nuggets, mm. your pearls of wisdom, that is. Um, and we've got a wee gift. Where are they? Where's, where's presents? Behind there. Behind there. Can I get it? I've had four beers, that's fine. I'm happy. Yeah.